No one, not even the president, is safe from coronavirus. The prime minister is now in intensive care with COVID-19. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has gone into home quarantine after a doctor who treated her was diagnosed with the coronavirus. What happens when a world leader dies in office? Coronavirus has thrown up this huge question, which has actually come up again and again throughout history, yet no one ever seems fully prepared. Boris Johnson thankfully survived his brush with COVID-19, but who was really in charge while he was out of action? And what if illness inflicted Donald Trump and he was unable to perform his duties? In North Korea, Kim Jong-un recently fell off the radar. Who'd have taken his place if he died? And would it have got messy? So as this potentially life-threatening virus spreads to more and more political leaders around the world, we need to talk about how governments and societies deal with their political lines of succession. The coronavirus pandemic has shown that our political leaders can be just as much at risk as anyone else. Here in the UK, that reality hit home when Boris Johnson caught the disease at the start of April. Alas, I still have uh, one of the symptoms, a minor symptom of, I, have, I still have a temperature. I must continue uh, my self-isolation until uh, that symptom itself goes. But his symptoms didn't go away. And a few days later, the Prime Minister was taken to hospital and moved to an intensive care unit. Things were looking seriously bad. And his advisors actually started planning how they would announce his death to the media. This is what he said when he eventually got out of hospital. The NHS has saved my life, no question. Things could have gone either way. Boris Johnson is now back at work, but while he was away, there were concerns about a possible power vacuum. Like who was standing in for him? And would that person really have authority to lead the country? You see, unlike nations like the US, here in the UK, there's no written constitution. There are no official set rules on exactly what happens and what the chain of command is. So there was a lot of discussion with Boris about who would be next and what happened if the entire cabinet went down one by one, which then the reasonable question would be, well, if, they all, if they're all dropping, then what happens after we've gone through, presumably, foreign minister, home secretary, chancellor? You know, at, at what point does the whole system start to fold? In the end, when Boris was in hospital, it was the foreign secretary, Dominic Raab, who stepped in. But even then, some people questioned what power Mr Raab actually had. Was he allowed to hire and fire different government ministers? Could he have pressed the nuclear button? Or even could he have decided when the UK could start ending its lockdown? What everyone has been saying while Boris has been away is, well, no decisions could be made because, uh, you know, the emperor is out of action. And I suppose there must be some truth in that. But that really does pin the idea that single individuals shape the entire destiny of a country. And most historians don't think society or even politics works that way. The whole point of a cabinet is that you have whatever the number is now, 23, who, who are able to, who should be able to govern the country together. Now, if that all sounds a bit too complicated, you might think the solution is a written constitution clearly setting out exactly what the rules are about the chain of command. But it doesn't necessarily fix all the problems. In the United States, they've had a written constitution for well over 200 years. But it wasn't until the 1960s that people realised the constitution didn't do enough to address this important issue. Who takes control when the president dies? You know what's coming next. A dark page in the annals of America has been written to the crack of an assassin's bullet. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy was shot dead while riding in an open-top limo. Just over two hours later, Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson, known as LBJ, was quickly sworn in as the new president, while still on board Air Force One. But it still raised big concerns about the chain of command and whether the constitution was really good enough, especially as LBJ had medical problems of his own. There is no vice president now to take LBJ's place in the event that LBJ dies or is disabled. So this led to the 25th Constitution Amendment, which laid down a more rational uh, means of succession. By amending the Constitution, American politicians thought they'd solve the problem once and for all. And if any president was ever incapacitated again, there were clear rules about what happens next. But unfortunately, things didn't work out like that. This grainy footage shows the moment a guy called John Hinckley Jr. pulled out a gun and shot President Ronald Reagan as he was walking to his limo. The bullet ricocheted off the car and punctured one of Reagan's lungs, causing him to suffer serious internal bleeding. By the time they got him to hospital, he was close to death. The Constitution laid out exactly who was in control and under what circumstances. But in the heat of the moment, things played out differently. Secretary of State Alexander Haig walked into the press briefing room without consultation and the disastrous result was caught on camera 
in this now historic footage. As of now, I am in control here in the White House. But of course, he had no constitutional authority to say that. He was not the next in line of succession. That was George H.W. Bush, the vice president. But the line of succession isn't the only thing that governments need to worry about when their leader goes down. Sometimes there's also the possibility of civil unrest. And throughout history, it's this that's been the real recurring nightmare. Here's an example. In the UK, only one prime minister has ever been assassinated. Spencer Percival back in the year 1812. He was shot dead as he walked into the Houses of Parliament in London. Within hours, people started gathering around Parliament to celebrate the Prime Minister's death. One account even compared it to a festival. Historians say that at one point, the crowd started chanting, Percival is down, the Prince Regent must be next, in a direct threat to the royal family itself. Any signs of any uprising were immediately stopped. But historically, in some countries, we know that power vacuums can be the trigger for major political and social change. As coronavirus spreads across the world, what are the chances that it could actually cause a big power vacuum somewhere and lead to some kind of major political transition? The transition moment is one of, of acute fragility because it allows for a new network to be built. By and large, people who want to benefit from that patronage are very quick to move. In, in the Mongol world, for example, in tribal societies, what tends to happen is that when a leader is incapacitated, everybody races back to the physical center of power to see who's going to get chosen next. And when a really leader dies, it's, it's like dealing a new hand of poker. In ancient Rome, every time an emperor died, that was the moment to lock your doors and fear the worst. Because if you were either on the wrong side or you're too close to the last emperor or potentially thought too close to a rival, you know, you, you had your name on a list and you'd be taken care of. One place everyone's been talking about recently is North Korea, because a lot of rumours have been flying around about the country's dictator, Kim Jong-un. Initially, there was speculation that he might be seriously ill with coronavirus. He's now been pictured in public again. But it's impossible to know exactly what's going on because the regime is so secretive. But by looking back at the country's last leader, Kim Jong-un's dad, we can learn quite a lot about how the regime deals with a power vacuum. So it turns out that Kim Jong-il, his father, had suffered a stroke and was in a coma in August 2008. And the North Koreans kept that secret and kept that quiet for weeks. And it was only on September 9th, 2008, when he was expected to appear at a major military uh, parade. A big military parade was planned for this big anniversary. And I cannot tell you, it just meant shivers through my spine when the cameras panned and he wasn't there. I just, we all knew immediately something was, something was going on. North Korea didn't confirm that. What they did was continue to keep us and the North Korean people in the dark for months. And that's the weird thing. In a way, dictatorships and authoritarian governments are sometimes able to deal with this issue in a smoother way, simply because they suppress any opposition and information. It's hard for us in the West to comprehend how one family has been able to hold onto power like that. It's been handed down from grandfather to father to grandson. We do know that Kim Jong-un would want that next leader, his successor, to be a member of the Kim family. And he has passed several decrees requiring that the country be led by somebody who is descended from Kim Il-sung, their eternal president, his grandfather. However, the next generation, Kim Jong-un's daughter, she's only seven years old. So if he is ill for any reason, the small circle of leadership, they're really the only ones we're going to know. And they will go on lockdown. They will put the country on lockdown, in a sense, while they try to, to enforce unity, uh, try to control the narrative, and try to come up with a viable succession plan. For the time being, we just have to sit tight. But if and when political leaders become incapacitated or die, it could lead to some big political changes. And it could cause us to fundamentally rethink the rules over how power is passed from one person to the next. The situation that, that uh, we've seen developing uh, in the COVID-19 crisis has raised issues about the adequacy of succession rules. And uh, I would be very surprised if there was no consideration of uh, how to improve them, even perhaps in the United States itself, uh, because in a future pandemic, 
both the president and the vice president could quite easily uh, be incapacitated by severe illness, then you're in uncharted waters.